about the history and how it relates to today. Uh, something we couldn't be more proud to do here at the Johnson County Museum. About a little more than two years ago, our curative interpretation came to me and asked if we could focus a year on the history of redlining. And we knew it was important to do, especially in an anniversary year and a big year for us. Um, for those of you who don't know or didn't see the big blue banner out front, the Johnson County Museum is officially nationally accredited. So that's a really fun thing. And we thought, how can, how can we make a real impact on this? And um, for us, it was to do what we always do, which is to tell history and help our community better understand the development of Johnson County and also the development of suburbia in general. And for us, there's nothing in the 20th century that's more defining of the development of suburbia than the history of a short-lived federal policy, which is the topic of tonight. Um, and those of you, has anybody here seen the Red Line exhibit? Well, good. Would anyone recommend it to a friend? Oh my gosh, please do, because actually your word of mouth is more valuable than any ad I can buy. And we want tons of people to see this before January 7, 2023, when it closes. It was a real labor of love to put together this important history, and we do think it's been meaningful and impactful to everybody who's come through. It's resonating so much that we've had more demand for group tours than with any other exhibit, and that includes our one about Wizard of Oz, which would be hard to beat. <laughs> and, uh, and we are just so proud of our community for going on this journey through hard history with us. And even with all the words that are in the exhibit, those of you who've seen it know, there's a lot of words in this exhibit, there's a lot of history to unpack with this, um, there's more of the story than we could tell alone. So when we went into the research and the telling of this, we knew that part of the telling had to be our community. That we had to bring together cultural institutions um, and other organizations in that region to help tell this history of redlining, its story and its legacies. And tonight's panel is a byproduct of that. It's presented in partnership with the Parks and Recreation Foundation of Johnson County, the nonprofit partner of JCPRD. And it was um, the idea of bringing in together the idea of natural resources to this history. And I'm so glad that my consciousness was raised about this. Tonight we're going to discuss how the Blue River and its watershed uh, runs through formerly green-lined areas and those that were red-lined. It is water that, as one of our panelists stated in our prep sessions, doesn't know it has been divided time and time again by lines that we call county lines, city lines, state lines, and at times in history, red lines. And yet, this water that's been divided by humans throughout time bears the legacy of those divisions. The history of redlining runs through the waters and watershed of the Blue River we are discussing tonight. So let's just take a second and bear with me as I define redlining for you. Promise not to go long. Redlining is the systematic disinvestment of some neighborhoods and people in favor of other neighborhoods and people, largely made on the basis of race. The federal policy, which was in effect from the 1930s through the 1960s, redlined largely urban neighborhoods, making them ineligible for loans from the FHA, the VA, and later private industries that followed their suit. Suburban neighborhoods, on the other hand, were usually realigned. Federal home lending policies were directly influenced by decades of discriminatory banking in private industry, developers, and real estate practices. It was suburban developers in the real estate industry that articulated and promoted the idea that race and value were connected in real estate. And although that idea was unfounded, they promoted it um, to make race a critical element of lending. As a result of this association of race and risk, Federal funds and priorities flow to almost entirely white populations in the post-war suburban communities through home mortgages, through the FHA and the VA, and conventional banking products and state funding, even mirror these policies. So it happens it has a far reach. Urban neighborhoods and communities of colors, often one in the same in redlined areas, experience a lack of investment, high rates of loan denial and rejection, and discrimination in lending, moving, and economic development. Red line areas and the populations who lived in them were labeled as too risky for doing business. Where there was a go uh, government and private, where there, uh, where the government and pri private, um, it red line and segregated uh, spaces when they did invest in those areas, it often came through in the guise of things like urban renewal projects or the development of private industrial sites. Green line suburbs, on the other hand, were protected by restrictive covenants that prohibited certain races and ethnicities from buying homes and defined the ways those communities were developed. Green light spaces benefited from the protection and proliferation of green spaces 
and a concerted investment in infrastructure. Red Line spaces lacked these investments, and over decades of disinvestment became home to dilapidated housing and crumbling infrastructures, high rates of pollution and toxic brown zones, and as a result, increased community vulnerability and life expectancies. So the New Deal policy of redlining set the stage for the modern day legacies that we see today on our built environment, on our natural landscape, and in the human condition. And that's what we're here to talk about tonight. We've got a really great panel here um, to uh, help share with you and unpack this history and, uh, and the present ramifications of it. And to introduce our panel, I get to introduce Jeff Stewart, who's Executive Director of JCPRD, and he will introduce our panelists. We'll talk for about 40 minutes, and then we will do some Q&A at the end, so get your questions ready. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Mary. Can everyone hear me? Did you say I get 40 minutes, Mary, or the panel? <laughs> okay, thank you for clearing that up. Well, it's wonderful to see all of you, and it truly is an honor to introduce uh, our panel here uh, to you this evening. I want to thank all of you on behalf of Johnson County Park and Recreation District, as well as the Parks and Recreation Foundation of Johnson County, uh, for being here. Uh, I think you're going to learn a lot, and it's really interesting uh, information, and I want to thank everyone uh, on our panel for uh, giving their time to share with us this evening. So we'll introduce this kind of like an all-star team here. As I uh, start to introduce and share a little bit about each one of them, they'll come up here and, and have a seat and be prepared to share with you this evening. And I'd like to start with our moderator, uh, Jeannie Moore. Jeannie is the Kansas State Director for the Conservation Fund, providing local, state, and national partners with the fund's full array of conservation programs and initiatives. For more than 25 years, Jean's passion and profession has been focused on environmental law and natural resource protection in both rural and urban settings. Jean's previous experience includes serving as executive director of the Blue River Watershed Association, the Kansas Land Trust, and the Assistant Regional Council at the U.S. EPA Region 7. Jeannie received her BA from the University of Iowa and her JD with distinction from the University of Iowa College of Law. She's a member and in good standing of the Missouri Bar. So why don't you welcome Jeannie to the center. Our first panelist here is Queen Wilkes. Uh, Queen is a Kansas City native who graduated from the University of Denver in 2018 with a BA in Strategic Communications and a minor in History. Queen has worked with several organizations including the KC STEM Alliance, the Little Blue River Watershed Coalition, Healthy Rivers Partnerships, uh, Green Works in KC and Lakeside, at Lakeside Nature Center. Queen loves uh, work that is centered around youth and community engagement, and I gathered that from just visiting with her uh, earlier this evening. And this is why she presently works on contract with the Heartland Conservation Alliance as conservation coordinator to help develop a conservation jobs training program for youth called the Nature Action Crew. Welcome, Queen. And our next panelist is Dr. Jacob Wagner. Uh, Dr. Wagner teaches urban planning and design at UMKC. He's a faculty founder of the UMKC Center for Neighborhoods a research and outreach unit dedicated to building the capacity of neighborhoods or neighborhood leaders and advocates in western Missouri. He's a member of the advisory board of the International Journal of Urban Design. Please welcome Dr. Wagner. Our next panelist is Lee Kellenberg. Lee is a manager of Johnson County Stormwater Management Program the Stormwater Management Program is an agency of Johnson County, Kansas government that provides financial, technical, and other stormwater planning assistance to the 20 cities in Johnson County. Lee has a bachelor's and master's degree from the University of Kansas in environmental studies and water resources science. Lee has been with the county for 17 years now. Welcome, Lee, please. Well, I get to see and 
work with this gentleman every single day. It is our own Bill Mawson in Johnson County Park and Recreation District. Bill is our superintendent of parks and golf courses for the Johnson County Park and Recreation District, serving a population of over 600,000 here in Johnson County. And we now maintain a little over, own and maintain a little over 10,000 acres, much of which Bill in his 35 years with JCPRD has uh, had his hands in uh, making possible. Uh, that the property welcomes over 7 million visitors on an annual basis, and it includes two golf courses and 14 separate parks and streamway parks. Um, and so uh, certainly Bill is a, is a busy person each and every day. Um, as I said, Bill's been with the district for a little over 35 years. He uh, started in November of 1986. And Bill received his Bachelor's of Science in Forestry from the University of Missouri and a Master's of Public Administration from the University of Kansas. So welcome, Bill. Red there, Tomahawk Creek, and then of course 
said, connect our region across state, county, and city boundaries, as Mary talked about. But we've not always looked at the river as a connector. And the ways in which we've used the land within the watershed, as well as the river itself, have not always served our region and its diverse communities well. What we're talking about tonight is a story of division within the Blue River watershed. But it's also, hopefully, a discussion of a good future, a hopeful future, of how we can change our approach to the river and the watershed to benefit both the Blue River itself and all of the communities that it impacts. So what I'd like to do is start uh, with a little bit of what I'll call ground setting. And that's, let's, let's talk about some history. And let me start with, with Jake. Um, Jake, as you know, during the first half of the 20th century, industry and commerce were booming in the Kansas City, uh, in Kansas City, Missouri, in the, the portions of the watershed that what we call downstream, in other words, closer to the Missouri River. Could you briefly describe the importance of the industry and commerce in the Blue River watershed to the development of Kansas City and in particular the working class in Kansas City? Sure thing. So if we look at the lower Blue River here, um, and we can continue the next slide, that's fine. Um, the part that we mostly work with is on the Missouri side with the MPC and the Center for Neighborhoods. But we're talking from Brush Creek and Town Fork Creek north through that Blue River uh, corridor, the lower Blue River there. And that's largely a number of neighborhoods. So there are neighborhoods that are often right on the edge of industrial districts. So Dunbar, Leeds is right in the middle next to the Leeds plant. Uh, and then Eastwood Hills is up kind of on the other side as you head towards the stadiums. And then a number of neighborhoods that are in the tributaries. So Town Fork Creek is actually a neighborhood name as well as a, as a tributary. So when we think about the Blue River, that lower Blue River, it has been a working landscape for a very long time, right? It has been industrialized, it has been used in many different ways in terms of agriculture, industry. If you look at just that geography, you can still see the remnants of that very industrialized history. The role of the railroads after sort of the, uh, you know, the steamboat era and the era of early transportation on the river. Then you get the industrialization with the railroads. And so if you look at all the major industry, Armco Steel, they go way back into the, the past really 135 years. So some of the earliest land that was laid out was around the 1880s, and there was a boom in the 1880s. So places like Sheffield uh, and Leeds, which have very English names, were actually funded by uh, money from England. Dr. Bill Worley has uh, identified that in his research that it was actually capital from English capitalists who invested in some of the early industrial neighborhoods like Sheffield, which is like, where did that name come from, right? So you have that early agriculture, orchards, but then after a while it starts to be like the backyard of the city. And so you start to see what might be considered unwanted land uses in other parts of the city increasingly being concentrated by the city and other actors along that blue, lower Blue River corridor. So you get things like penitentiaries, right? So the, the workhouse at Vine Street, which is getting fixed up now at 20th and Vine, there was another facility built because they really outgrew that. You have the municipal farm expand. So you have this uh, growth of the landscape shaped by labor, but also shaped by labor where people are working because uh, they're prisoners. So you have actual prison labor that's producing that lower part of the Blue River. And that really is the root of some of the inequalities that we still see in this day, is that many of the unwanted land uses had to be somewhere. Right. Uh, right. At the same time, um, that brings us to sort of how do we get to this industrial moment. Those jobs were very important for the growth of Kansas City. And I think every um, you know, residential neighborhood that benefited from a diverse industrial robust industry uh, on the Kansas side and on the Missouri side were very important. So that, that context was very necessary for the suburbanization that we see in Johnson County. Yeah, very, that's very, very true. But then, of course, in Johnson County, 
Um, things remained predominantly agricultural until probably about the middle of the 20th century or so. And that's when J.C. Nichols and other big developers came in and started to develop the suburbs. And so let me ask you, Lee, um, as communities in Johnson County grew and the land became more impervious, that is to say more covered by surfaces that water doesn't sink into, how did those development patterns affect stormwater and impact the Blue River and its watershed? Yeah, sure, Danny. So, you know, as you mentioned, prior to 19, the 1940s, the uh, majority of Johnson County was agricultural still. And, and you know, J.C. Nichols hashed this idea of a suburb of suburbs and sold it to folks on the idea that we could move, uh, move out to a more pastoral setting and escape the, you know, the noise and commotion of the city and set up this idea of this commute, you know, be an automobile or public railroads that were being built during the day. And, uh, and it worked, you know, and, and we had vast uh, developments go in in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s in Johnson County. And with that development, of course, you know, you're converting pasture and cropland into putting up roads and buildings and houses and stuff. So with all that extra impervious surface comes additional runoff. And just due to the geography and the, and of our of watershed, that development was occurring what we call upstream. So that runoff is being directed downstream onto our neighbors on the Missouri side. To make matters worse, uh, natural streams were, were seen as an impediment to development in, that, in the early days. So at, whenever possible, uh, developers were allowed to uh, enclose streams underground, put them in pipes, you know, get them out of the way. They like nice, orderly developments, uniform lots, straight roads. And so that only made matters worse. So now, not only were we having more runoff, it was being collected and transmitted to, our, to the river in, in much less time. And so it led to additional flooding downstream and uh, you know all sorts of uh, uh, persistent flooding that, that still exists today. People didn't want to see water. They wanted it to be dis to disappear, to go someplace where they didn't have to deal with it any longer. So, um, but water could have been a recreational resource. Built as communities in Johnson County grew, how did recreational amenities fit into the picture? Did developers? Well, it's interesting because developers and, and our citizens kind of turned their back to the creeks and rivers. It's like you just didn't go there. Just didn't go there, but in the early 80s, the old apartment in Leewood started this crazy idea of building linear parks along the Indian Creek and Tomahawk Creek. And Johnson County Park and Recreation District had a strategic plan that recommended the creation of a linear park system throughout the county area. And it was a kind of a landmark study that became a blueprint for what Johnson County has become. It's become a community with over 350 miles of trails, many of those which are long our linear parks so long creeks in the county but back in those early days in the 70s 60s and 70s the, the parks were still neighborhood parks the biggest park anywhere was Antioch Park it was 40 acres 44 acres um, it just was something that we didn't need because we had all this open space to drive to so kind of a, a little bit of a foundation and so you know as you both brought up um, obviously, water flows downstream and has a direct impact on what happens in downstream areas and disinvestment in the industrial corridors of the lower part of the, of the Blue River. And lots of flooding, massive flooding. We've, we've all heard about flooding. I remember not even living here in 1977 when Brush Creek flooded and wiped out half the Country Club Plaza. But so we've had floods in Brush Creek, Indian Creek, and the Blue River itself. So Lee, let me ask you, from your per perspective as a stormwater professional, could things have been different? Yeah, actually, uh, there, there was plans, um, if you bring up the, the next slide, there was actually a great plan that was pitched back in the early, early 60s um, to construct, you know, the first of kind of a foundational plan, a watershed master plan. Uh, that done by the Corps of Engineers. So, re recognizing that this development is occurring upstream and persistent and exacerbating the flooding downstream, the Corps of Engineers with the study proposed to make a plan. And there's two parts to this plan. Uh, the first one, uh, if you on the left there, you'll see uh, a 
a stretch of the Blue River, the lower area of these bottoms that is, is, is not, has a blue dot to it. And that's called the, low, the end proposed channel uh, improvement project. So that's a, an area from the confluence with the Missouri River all the way up to Swope Park. So that was a channel project. And then proposed uh, in the upstream end portions of the watershed were three reservoirs on the Kansas side and one on the Missouri side. Um, unfortunately, as a result, this didn't happen. So we'll get into that in a little bit. But, uh, this would have uh, done so much good uh, in, in terms of watershed management uh, for Johnson County and, and, and the entire watershed. So um, if you read news articles of the day and elected officials at the time, it was, it was coined as probably one of the worst decisions in Johnson County. As a stormwater manager, I, I do agree with that sentiment. You know, it's, it, it would have been so much good. So, to list off of just a couple of benefits and then I'll turn it over to Bill, you know, number one, it would have mitigated those high flows. So, um, it would have done what it was intended to do if the reservoirs would have been built. Kansas City, Missouri invested $70 million in their own taxpayer dollars, and the federal government invested another $300 million to build the channel project. Okay? So, that's been done. Uh, and that started in 1980 and was completed actually just about 10 years ago. So, however, that plan, those, those, that channel project was designed contemplating that the reservoirs were going to be built. So, instead of providing a, what we consider like a 100 year level protection, it only serves about a 30 year level of service. So, those industries that it was deemed to try to protect um, don't even realize that benefit. So, as, as a result, many of those industries have moved for due to persistent funding that still occurs today and, and for uh, other economic reasons. So, so high flow mitigation, on the flip side of that, low flow mitigation with drought and climate change, uh, reserv releases from left reservoirs can be used to supplement low flow during periods of, of drought and extreme drought. So that has a huge water quality benefit as well to, to uh, sustain a healthy aquatic ecosystem. And then, uh, and then, you know, probably another thing that a lot of us don't consider is uh, a potential drinking water source. So those, if those free reservoirs would have been built, they could have possibly potentially served as, a, as a, a more, uh, an option for drinking water uh, for the southeast portion of Johnson County. Um, the estimated cost of construction back in the day would have been $16 million. We far exceeded that building water distribution infrastructure bring water from the Missouri River and Kansas River all the way down to the line. And line. So uh, that is not an option for us anymore. And, and in the face of climate change, I think future generations would, would appreciate those reservoirs as an option for us. So not to mention all the recreational and you know, other opportunities and environmental benefits all that is. So Bill, yeah, tell us about the recreational opportunities. Yeah, so what um, happened? There, there could have been 8,000 acres of green space acquired by the Corps of Engineers. It was put to the voters on April 1st, 1975. It went down in flames. 61% against 39% in favor of, of the Corps of Engineers acquiring this 8,000 acres. There would have been over 2,000 acres of water in Johnson County. Currently, currently, all the lakes in our system have about 220 acres of water in our system. So think of Think of Blue Springs Lake or Longview Lake. That's the model that was proposed to be the reservoirs, the recreation potential, boating and fishing, and just outdoor recreation potential. But as Lee said, this will never happen now. This will never happen now. Uh, but it was presented to the voters, and it was going to be part of uh, the Johnson County Park Recreation District's ownership. Um, and it was going to be a, a two, two mil levy increase. The core was, if the voters would have approved it in 1975, within five years they would have acquired all 8,000 acres. And if you can see on the images, the blue line, the big bold blue line, was the limits of acquisition. You can see the light bluish line, which is the boundary of the, of the lake itself. So what you're seeing is the, the Wolf Creek corridor. So that, the dam would have been right about at uh, 69 Highway. That gives you some point of reference, uh, just a little bit west of Metcalf. Um, and then the Indian Creek um, Dam would have been built just about 69 Highway, just barely west of where the Double Tree is, if you know where that is. So these, these could have changed the way Johnson County developed, significantly changed the way Johnson County developed. But as 
reset. It will never happen. Which is really a shame when you think about, you know, the impact that Blue River watershed uh, and the Blue River have had on flooding, and in particular on uh, the deindustrialization in Kansas City, Missouri, in the second half of the 20th century. And so flooding obviously had a big, big impact on that. But, but Jake, what other factors caused some of that deindustrialization and, and the disinvestment in communities of color on the Kansas City side? Um, that's, that's a big question for <laughs> such a short amount of time. Um, so obviously, by the time you get the Plaza flood and, and the lower in the 70s, the deindustrialization process is already underway, right? Um, this shift of American manufacturing globally, the increasing change in how uh, industrial manufacturing is organized, firm location decisions radically changed. And some, you know, we think of Detroit as sort of the poster child for deindustrialization and the loss of jobs. But this was a global process, right, in terms of cha firms changing uh, where they located. So for a good period after World War II, there, there were a lot of uh, contracts that were still happening that were really helping, uh, you know, the auto industry and other uh, industrial manufacturers in our region. But eventually, um, that policy shifts, and it's not a priority to keep industry in the Blue River Valley in the same way. And, uh, as you mentioned earlier, right, there were changes that also um, made it difficult for firms to stay. And so the flooding is certainly part of that. This shows, uh, again, the Blue River uh, watershed. And then the next slide uh, is the red lining, should be the red lining, um, showing you the surrounding context. And so every neighborhood around the Blue River and the lower part was red lined except for the one blue one, which is hard to see, uh, is the Eastwood Hills neighborhood, which is more suburban and kind of up on the hill on, on your way to the, uh, if you know where Elsie's Barbecue is on the way to the stadium, that's where um, Eastwood Hills is. So everything else is pretty much red lined or yellow. So the surrounding neighborhoods were impacted by suburbanization, by loss of industrial jobs, by plants that closed down, the flooding did not did not help at all. Eventually, you get Farm Coast deal and GM plant closing, and those sites today are still there as um, you know un undeveloped sites. And so that loss of jobs, the loss of industry, the loss of local production, the shift in where those firms were locating, uh, it was just easier to move to a completely different location and start over again. So you see sites go into decline and then sit there, and in some cases. So there's an industrial side. The red lining is really on the on the residential side, right? So red lining is about risk in terms of where you can get a home mortgage. The flip side of that is all the neighborhoods that were close to industrial areas were all red lined, right? So these were working class neighborhoods, some of which, like if you look at Dunbar, which is just above where it says the Union Pacific Leeds Yard, you can see the yellow one is Leeds, which is in the floodplain, but because it was white, it was yellow. And, and the predominantly African-American neighborhood to the left there is all red. That's Dunbar. And it's actually on a hill out of the floodplain. But because it was an African-American neighborhood, which, by the way, was less than 20 years old at the time this map was made, most of the development of Dunbar happened in the 1920s and 30s. And then they were redlined in 1939 when this map came out. So, and that, that's a huge story in terms of the Dunbar neighborhood, their resilience, the fact that they're still there. But that gives you an example of how um, the attitude was to green line and to move away from the city. And that affects industry and industrial investment, but it also affects that residential environment as well. Absolutely. And um, if you look at some of the uh, articles that were in the press back at the time that the decision on uh, the reservoirs in Johnson County was made. The concept of redlining, the idea of people that uh, 
the J.C. Nicholson developers of the world didn't want in Johnson County. That under that tone underlay a lot of what happened during that period in time. Um, and, and so, Queen, tell me a little bit about in communities that you've been working in in Kansas City, Missouri, in communities uh, of color and disinvestment that you're now working in in Kansas City, Missouri. When you talk to those folks, how did they feel about the flooding, about the Blue River, about the pollution that some of those industries caused? Yeah, so um, honestly, I feel like um, because of Redline and because of this investment and flooding, there's been a disengagement. Um, it's very much out of sight, out of mind. Um, and it kind of brings me back to some of my work when I used to do tabling with DreamWorks and in KC. You would you know, have a cute little spin wheel where we'd ask people questions about the Blue River and the Missouri River and they could win prizes. And because they knew they were going to get a prize anyway, because we just wanted them to come to the table, um, they would be honest with us about how they felt about the Blue River and the Missouri River. And for the most part, they either one didn't know where these places were in relation to their neighborhoods. Um, and the people who did know were, they very much, you know, saw this, this is a dirty place, this is an unsafe place, and that matches the narrative. This is not a place I can go. Um, and that's really unfortunate because, you know, the Blue River is a major resource, an amazing resource for our most vulnerable communities. Um, kind of to what Jake was saying, like, there's an opportunity for jobs. Green careers are very much on the rise, they pay well, and to have people who are in these communities doing that work is essential. Um, there's also just the fact that it provides our drinking water. The Blue River connects to the Missouri River, and for those of us in Kansas City, and, and most of us in the general Kansas City community, um, we get our water from the Missouri River, so it's incredibly important that that is a sustained source. Um, but then there's also just to be like the community aspect. I, you know, the Blue River and the surrounding parks and areas, that's our place to like live, laugh, love it, you know? Like this is our place to learn about fishing and, you know, go and you know, fly kites with our family and it's a free place for us to commune and talk about how we can engage in our spaces and unify our communities. And when the people who live there, again the people who are most impacted um, by this long history of uh, discrimination are not engaging in those spaces. There is, you can feel it in those communities. And unfortunately, uh, again, if they're not on the side of, hey, I'm out of sight, out of mind, I kind of don't really care about it, I don't know where it is. For other people, it can very much be seen as a burden or even a liability because when you are close to spaces that are not maintained, like if anyone's ever been around water that's dirty, it smells bad. Like you can tell. And that kind of environment can make you sick, not just like actually physically, but emotionally, mentally. Um, you also have, you know, the, the animals that live in those spaces, if that's not a healthy space, then they find their ways into your homes and that can create pest problems. Um, you have people who are more likely to illegally dump because they don't care about the space. So it's not, you know, it, it's nothing to throw it over there despite the fact that these are people's homes. So yeah, I mean, the, how people view it, they either disengage or they kind of see it as a liability, like I don't want to live over there. The same way the map will kind of, you know, express they don't want to be near these places. Um, which again is really unfortunate because the Blue River has the potential, it's like our diamond in our backyard, it has the potential to be this amazing resource, so. Absolutely, yeah, it does. And um, hopefully, as times have changed, at least a little, um, we in the region have learned a few things, maybe, in the last hundred years. So now I'd like to turn our focus um, to efforts that are going on today to help address the inequities of, of past actions in our watershed. So let me start with you, Lee. Um, what changes has Johnson County and the communities in Johnson County made related to stormwater? Yeah. <clears throat> Good question, Jeannie. And, and uh, what's going on today? Well, our program exists because of these decisions that were made, you know, in the last 75 years of stormwater management. We, we really have done a great job of managing. Uh, our program works hard with the cities to go out and correct these issues. So, uh, you know, I mentioned the, the the reservoirs that didn't happen, and so as a result of that, we're we're constantly having to fund projects and improvements in our cities, 
and so was, so was Kansas City, Missouri as well. I mean, in addition to the channel project, they've invested about another hundred million dollars in three additional W projects along Sword Park, Dodson, uh, and the uh, Anderson Federal Complex. So to the tune of a hundred million dollars. And the, the, though its improvements could have been, those levies could have been much lower and, and cost much less, or been eliminated in need of those, the need could have been eliminated completely. And to add insult to injury, as you know, any given day we can have an event, a rainfall event, that can cost them that could cause hundred, you know, millions of dollars worth of damages. In 2017, we had homes flood, roads closed, uh, water rescues were needed because of Indian Creek flooding. So that's why our program exists. So um, we are changing the way we're prioritizing and formulating projects. Though. So we're trying to take this watershed concept rather than channelizing the water, trying to treat it more where it's where it falls, um, trying to encourage uh, better development practices. We, we, uh, be more open space, uh, encourage infiltration where, wherever possible. And then we're also trying to uh, look at how we're prioritizing projects, you know, based on uh, social vulnerabilities and stuff. So um, historically, the federal government and, and our program locally has been has had a cost-benefit ratio, a benefit-cost ratio, uh, where they look at the value of the, the property that's being protected versus the cost of the project. And if that didn't equal or exceed, then it was not a valid project. But what that tends to do is it tends to divert more money into more affluent or wealthier areas. So FEMA uh, was, has been guilty of that, and they're changing that quite a bit, and they're looking at uh, different ways to do prioritization so that they're not disinvesting and continuing to cycle of disinvestment. And then, so locally here, we're taking that same concept of the stormwater management program, and rather than doing a cost-benefit analysis in terms of the value of the property group, we're looking at taking into account uh, economically disadvantaged areas and maybe possibly one of the reasons that those neighborhoods are economically disadvantaged is because there's persistent flooding. So now in our program, given two equal flooding scenarios, the one that it, it is occurring in an economically disadvantaged area would get preference over the one in the more affluent community. So that is, um, thank you. So, what, we don't. We didn't come up with that idea. Uh, you know, it, it's being used in other areas of the country as well. Um, starting to be used in other areas of the country. And what it, and what the measure is, and the metric for that is, is the CDC calculates a social vulnerability index on a nationwide basis based on uh, uh, population data, and uh, so it's calculated twice uh, every two years. And uh, social vulnerability is a, is a measure of communities. Respond to a natural disaster. So, uh, areas that have a higher social vulnerability score uh, get a higher preference in our rating system. Well, that's awesome. That's a great change for, for Johnson County. Um, and, and I know Bill and Queen, you've uh, both been working on, on changes to help uh, address some of these um, inequities in the past. Bill, talk a little bit about how trails and parks and open space can help. So in all public surveys that JCPRD has ever done, the number one wish from our public is more trails, more open space along trees, more trails along the streams in our community. So we would like to see a progressive acquisition of real estate along the Blue River to connect Johnson County to Cape City, Missouri. There's a lot going on, and there's still a lot of opportunity in the Blue River. We just need to get out and preserve some of it. And I thank the Conservation Fund offering to help us fund some land acquisition and I'm hoping that in the next five years we can do that and preserve a lot of those acres that are still available for us to preserve west of state line. Um, it'll never have big enough watershed or big, big enough space to build lakes but it'll have enough that we can create the buffers along the, the rivers to help absorb storm water and filter out some of the pollutants before they run downstream. And that, that, that's excellent and I know Many in this audience would love to be able to ride their bikes or walk along those trails. So, in Queen, Highland Conservation Alliance has just been going great guns. Their focus is the Blue River and trying to change attitudes about the river and trying to encourage keeping that those trees along the, the river to buffer them. Tell me about what you have been doing working with Harvard Conservation Alliance along those lines. Yeah, I'm super excited. Okay, so um, 
I'm going to steal a bit of a spiel from one of my coworkers, uh, Sarah Bingham. So hopefully she sees this and she can uh, be excited about it. Um, but for the Harlem Conservation Alliance, we kind of focus on two main areas, or what we call our two main areas, which are the blue and the green. The blue and the green. Um, the green is more of our like boots on the ground. That is um, a lot of our like honey stuff removal and invasive species removal, uh, forest management, things like that. Like more of our um, on the land kind of things. And because we know that everything that ends up in the ground ends up in our water, we also have an emphasis on the blue. So that's our work, like the Blue River, supporting uh, stream teams and all of that good work. And um, some of the ways that we go about addressing those two focuses is. Um, conservation, alliance, and outreach. So um, from our outreach portion of things, we have like our Blue River report card. I actually have, so like, if you were in the reception area, there might be some more hanging out or you might have already grabbed some, but that is a report card that we put out every couple of years that you know allows the community to kind of follow the, the journey of the Blue River and the work that we're doing there. We are very excited to say that you know, we've been to a C minus to a C, you know, it's a lot of great progress. to just, you know, we love working with partners. There are wonderful people on the stage who do conservation work, and we love working with them, um, including on projects like the Blue River Greenway Project. Um, I'm not the expert on that, but one of the things I love about it is the way that it connects some of our, some of our most affluent communities in Johnson County to our most vulnerable communities in Kansas City. So there's shared recreation space, you know, that's, that's equity and inclusion at its finest. Um, we also uh, have our conservation needs, and that's the part that I tend to do a little bit more work in. Um, so I'm going to talk about the Nature Action Crew in that sense. Um, the Nature Action Crew, I love it because we have young people, um, ages 18 to 24, um, some of which we partner with our um, Cornerstones of Care and their program Build Tribe. So these are people who are aging out of the foster care system. Um, and we get them connected to conservation-based jobs and conservation-based learning. So um, they come in, they get mentored by some of our staff, they're connecting with you know, uh, conservation professionals, and they're getting on the grounds work. Like they're doing hundreds of removal, and they are um, learning about water quality testing. They're learning these things, and they're able to, again, like they live in these environments, they live in these communities, and they're learning how to maintain them. And so those are really um, big things. And, and one of these, uh, the recent projects that our Nature Action Crew has assisted with that I'm super excited about because I live here is um, the Palestine East Corridor project that we have. And so this is about 20 acres of land um, that we are working to restore and basically create, like, I consider it like an urban oasis. So it's uh, the space between 33rd and 39th in like Norton and Mersington and really between the spaces. Um, and in that area, we are working on getting like bee boxes and uh, places for native edibles so people can you know, walk by and just enjoy them. Um, learning about composting, a place for art, a place for gathering. Again, that live, laugh, love it, other all. So, um, yeah, those are some of the things that we're doing to bring people back into the community, to connect people to nature. Well, that's very exciting, and it sounds like you're an incredibly busy person. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jake, tell me a little bit about what the Center for Neighborhoods is doing in some of these. Uh, sure, actually, Dina Newman, who's the director of the Center for Neighborhoods, is working on the Palestine Memorial Project. It's a big group effort with the neighborhoods around that corridor. It's an old, uh, almost like a street that was never developed. So it's like an urban watershed that's in the back of people's houses. So we're work, uh, our directors work with those folks. We've been working quite a bit with the Dunbar neighborhood. They'll be featuring their history in the Kansas City Museum uh, next year, which is one of our partners, to celebrate local history. So we'll be kind of unpacking the history of the Dunbar Leeds area and sort of some of these issues around, um, you know, black suburbanization, when African-American families were able to move out of the city with their own home, their own piece of land, and then the challenges that folks faced in Dunbar over the years as a result of all kinds of disinvestment and redlining and other. But still sticking with it, still being resilient, still being engaged. 
There's a lot of good things happening in the Blue River Valley. I'm really encouraged. The Jackson County Parks is doing a strategic plan for the part of the of the watershed and basically south of Swope Park. So there's a lot of work going on in both the parks departments on both sides. There's a lot of citizen action around, you know, uh, really stewardship around neighborhoods, right? So understanding that environmental component at a very, very high level. Um, there's a lot of awareness um, around some of the uh, vulnerable species, like bat species that are found uh, in and around municipal farms. So there's more environmental awareness of how human action in the Blue River, the lower Blue River, impacts that remaining habitat and, and vulnerable species. There's uh, an effort to do more regenerative work to understand the next phase of our economy has to be about industrial regeneration and really creating a more sustainable economy that doesn't really take advantage of ecosystem services and, and pollute water and soil, but really restores that and then creates new economies from that restoration process. So it's, it's like the work that Heartland Conservation Alliance is doing, but like on steroids. Like you need to have to do out the whole corridor. Uh, and so there's regeneration for found, uh, Foundation for Regeneration that's working on that. They're working with neighborhoods and then also the Blue Valley Industrial District folks are also trying to change their thinking around how we value property in a formerly industrial area and what does the next 100 years look like. So there's a lot of work going on, but I don't think it's like connected in the same way. What I love about this is we're actually talking about the watershed that connects us. And that's the first time I've really ever heard anybody in the Kansas City region talk about watershed thinking as a framework for planning the future. And I think that's really critical. And it really does sort of say, hey, we're all in the same boat together. I've lived in New Orleans where that's an obvious issue, and I've lived in Oregon where watershed planning has been around for, for decades, so I'm glad to see we're kind of arriving at that moment together, finally here in, in our region. I think it's long and we're new. And it, that, it, it is awesome, and so there is a lot of work going on on the ground. A lot of this work is on the ground, but I'm wondering, are we really doing enough as a region? Have our development patterns changed? in ways that really address all of the issues that we've talked about today. So I open that up uh, to, to panelists and to others. Um, what do you think? Are we doing enough? What could we be doing? What could we be learning from other communities? No, we're not doing enough. That's, that's, that's my, yeah. my two cents. We're not doing enough. That's what it's hard to leave. You know, I'm not a planning, I'm not a planner, but I, I, I look at the development that occurring, is still occurring in Johnson County today. Uh, some of the same developers are still in the game that were in the game in the 70s. And if you look at the subdivision standards or development policies and practices, uh, what it takes to build build in Johnson County, it definitely is, is leads to less economic diversity and therefore I mean, also less racial diversity. So I think we need to really take a step to the heart of our development policy if there's still racism in there, you know. Other comments? Go ahead, Mary. Oh, oh Mary, you're telling me to cut us off? <laughs> the queen can make a comment. I'll just say, Leslie, yeah, no, I don't think we're doing enough. Uh, as a parent by our Blue River Report Card, as a, I mean, we're at a seat. They, I, we have an A as an option. So um, that's what we would like to be. Um, but at the same time, I do think I appreciate everyone for coming out today um, because we are taking steps and progress is really important. We have to start somewhere. Um, I will just, you know, a quick little, another, another, um, uh, no, I want to go for it. But so I went on a random, unexpected excursion today where I was just walking through my neighborhood. I was not expecting that. I thought I was going to get the bus, ended up missing it, and I just took a long walk. And it was super nice because um, I got to see, you know, one of the churches that was in my neighborhood just put together a little cute portrait where you could walk by and just kind of grab apples and stuff. And I just think, you know, that wasn't there five years ago. Um, somebody decided to do that. And I appreciate them for doing that because on my own, you know, track, I got to grab an apple. And so, you know, there are a bunch of organizations up here today. We all have websites. Please check them out. Um, but even if the only thing you can do is go out and take a walk by, by the Blue River and takes a moment for appreciation, that would be great. So. Wow, this panel, um, so much expertise. I wish we could have gone all night. Uh, but we do have some time for about three questions. So is anyone interested in asking a question of this wonderful panel of experts? Um, so 
scholarship perspective. Never seen that before. <laughs> I don't see very metro, many metro areas around the country described or shown in a map that way. And I just wonder about the possibilities of communications, PR, education, everywhere. Just to start to tell the story of where do you live according to your watershed when most of these creeks, I'm guessing, are in concrete and you never even know you're crossing these creeks. Education, PR, communications. Yes, we need that. We need yeah. that. Yeah. T-shirts, uh, swag, everything. Right? I would just add that um, not every metropolitan area has a state line in the middle of it. So generally speaking, it's a little easier don't have two states arguing about things. So that's that's kind of been the, the cross we bear in, in the Kansas City metropolitan area. Always has been. We're still fighting the Civil War in a lot of ways. So rivers don't know that. Yeah. No, they don't. And and but building the consciousness that we're all on the same boat and that you know a drop of water that is in this area goes to the same uh, in the same general direction. You know, we worked a lot in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, and there's nothing like a disaster to remind you of how fragile human systems are. And so, you know, I really think it's a, it is about next generation thinking, right? Like, let's get the young people to understand this from the get go. Most of them do, and they're already on it, and they're chomping at the bit for change. So I just see we need to facilitate that cultural change. And yes, it's about marketing. Like, let's just start with saying, hey, like, I'm a proud member of the Blue River Watershed, period, regardless of, um, you know, geography, regardless of council, district, municipality, et cetera. And I remember the first time one of my students brought me that map, and instead of having the state line, they had a truce on there, right? And that was the first time I had seen that, you know, way south in Johnson County is connected to east of truce. Like literally connected, and so that is the mindset shift. And visuals and marketing and graphics always help because we're a very visual society. So, good, good point. And I want to give a, I want to give a shout out actually to the Mid American Regional Council, which does a wonderful job actually of trying to get these messages across, and also to Heartland Conservation Alliance, um, which also has a great website that talks a lot about watersheds, what it is, and why. And Johnson County's Stormwater Management Program also has a good website that can give you some of that information. But you're right, the word doesn't get out there. You have to sort, search for it rather than it coming to you. And you know, I think that is, again, I guess to like the disengagement point. It's like most people, because you don't think about the river and if you do hear stuff about it, like it might not always be the most popular. Dirty and unsafe are the two things that no one wants to be near, especially in the last few years. Like any place that you can consider to be dirty and unsafe is a no-go. And a big part of you know how we speak as conservationists is, is changing that narrative. It's like, hey, there's places that we'd like us to go. There are things that we want in the river and things that we don't, but it's still a place that we should be. A big part of that is infrastructure too. And I know we're in a moment of infrastructure investment. And um, you know, infrastructure is generally invisible until it fails, right? And so, what we're in right now is a moment where we should be getting people who are still on septic systems in the Blue River watershed off septic systems. We should be really thinking about the long term of a generational investment in infrastructure, and then also. When we teach about green infrastructure, the difference between green and gray is actually people. Like, green infrastructure requires human stewardship and care. So the work that the conservation folks are doing to, to get people to be comfortable with like what it means to get dirty and do the work, right? That's the difference between green infrastructure and gray. Gray just pushes it all away as fast as you can and covers it up. And green says we've got to be involved in how this infrastructure works. So it's about visibility, but it's also about care and teaching communities to actually take part in building their infrastructure and being part of that, whether it's a bike path, uh, you know, what happens between the curves or, you know, what happens behind their house in, in a, a, a creek. So. Great question. I just wanted to kind of bounce off some of the things that have been said. Thank you so much for this great panel discussion. Um, well, alluded to it, right? Like the Kansas City metropolitan area sits on a very unique by state uh, geographic location, right? And clearly water doesn't know boundaries and borders can't be arbitrary, 
So I think there are some 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 initiatives right now to go after some federal funding for the infrastructure. So we are uh, looking at the region and some of that stuff. Um, also, as a region, and, and this is long overdue, but we're looking at revising our hard design standards for stormwater management. Kind of flipping it on its head. It's long overdue. Uh, we, we've learned a lot in the last 30 years since they were, or 20 years since the last time they were developed. So, but that takes engagement and education from the development community. And elected officials sometimes don't like to make that hard decision to say, no, developer A, you have to do it this way. Mm -hmm. They get very or they, they grant their waivers. So, um, we need to educate our elected officials about the importance of, of uh, I don't know, you know my storm, stormwater soapbox, but of uh, proper stormwater management, because it really leaves a legacy for, for generations to come. We're paying for the, for the uh, uh, mistakes that our forefathers made still today. So, um, education is key in that our elected to our officials that we need, we need to change. Y'all, we have one more question. We're three minutes over. Are you comfortable with that? Yeah. Yeah. First, uh, thank you all for what you're doing to contribute to this issue and, and you and your organizations and your partner organizations. I'm curious, I guess I want to ask a couple of questions that are related. One is, do any of you already, are you already working on a proposal for infrastructure money? Uh, and two, why not?